Harvard Divinity School. Expressions of Sumud in Palestinian Higher Education, April 26, 2022. Welcome everyone to our final event in our spring semester series, Disrupting Injustice and Promoting Moral Imagination in Israel-Palestine. My name is Hilary Rantisi, and I'm the Associate Director of the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative, a program of religion and public life at Harvard Divinity School. I'm also a co-instructor of Learning in Context, Narratives of Displacement and Belonging in Israel-Palestine, also offered at the Harvard Divinity School. During this semester, our series showcased religion, conflict, and peace fellows and their work. Uh, while affiliated with our program, they have all worked on a variety of projects. If you haven't been able to join us for this series, I encourage you to visit our website to learn about all these projects. It's been an exciting semester hearing about their work um, that they have been working on and what they have accomplished during their fellowship with us, from illuminating transnational solidarities to reimagining Jewish identity to rethinking rebuilding Gaza, the creation of two exhibits, and weaving within all of these projects is the cultivation of moral imagination and creative possibilities for a just peace in Israel-Palestine. A brief word about our work for those of you unfamiliar with it. At the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative, our work centralizes an analysis of structural injustice, violence and power and examines how a more capacious understanding of religion can yield fresh insights into contemporary challenges and opportunities for just peace building. The primary case study we're focusing on is Israel-Palestine and our aim is to stretch the scholarly discourse around religion and the practices of peace building and examine the decolonial potentialities of art, religion and identity transformation. Today's event highlights the work of our fellow Rana Khouri. Rana is the Vice President for Development and Outreach at Dar al Kalima University, where she also manages the civic engagement and adult education tracks at the university. Her project as an RCPI fellow has been to develop a civic engagement curriculum for Palestinian higher education, drawing upon religion, culture, and the arts to facilitate dialogue reflection and change. However, during your time with us, uh, this project, the focus of the project developed more uh, in the direction of uh, focusing on the concept of Sumud and its role in Palestinian life. So today she'll be sharing with us her exploration of developing this dedicated curriculum, centering Sumud and the experience of Dar al Kalima University in shaping Palestinian students as cultural activists. Thank you all for joining us today. And now um, I welcome Rana to join us. Um, and let's maybe briefly, Rana, if, before we start, I think if you could share with us a brief interpretation of what is meant by Samud. I know you're going to go into more detail on this later. But the, for those of us who may not uh, know Arabic or not familiar with the term, just very briefly. And then if you could share with us your impetus of why you started this project, where's inspiration for this? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Hillary. Before I start, uh, I would like to thank you uh, and the RCPI uh, team, Harvard Divinity uh, School, uh, and especially, uh, Professor Atalia Omer, Professor Diane Moore, and Reem Atassi for all the support and all the wonderful opportunity that uh, I have received, which enabled me to develop this idea further. So thank you very much. Uh, yes, I will. Uh, I will go into a, a more detailed description and definition of what Sumud is, but the literal translation uh, uh, is uh, actually steadfastness, perseverance, and it is in connection to uh, the Palestinian uh, population in meeting and challenging uh, the occupation, the Israeli occupation, and the 100-year-old settler colonial system that has been 
uh, imposed, and uh, it is in connection to that uh, struggle and uh, to resistance uh, for uh, uh, for uh, for freedom and uh, liberation. Um, yeah, I would like before we really start the conversation, I would like to share with you. Uh, why I have decided to do this and why did I uh, go into this project uh, specifically. Uh, aside from the fact that I had worked on civic engagement and uh, uh, leadership programs uh, in my university uh, in, in, in the over 15 years actually of doing so, but the real uh, um, reason and the real inspiration was actually my mother, uh, Georgette, uh, who uh, actually, uh, she was the main uh, driving force. It is not unique to herself as my mother, but she is uh, like so many similar, uh, so many others, is actually her smooth, this steadfastness is indicative of this, uh, this force that make us all as a population persevere. And uh, in doing so, I would like to read something as an, a prologue introduction uh, for the curriculum that uh, I uh, am working on uh, that, uh, that shows a genealogy of Sumut, uh, which is passed on from one generation to the next. Uh, and so please allow me, uh, I will be personal for five minutes, uh, but yes. I think it's very important to understand uh, how uh, Sumut is communicated uh, from one uh, generation to the next. Okay. <clears throat> so this curriculum is a labor of love. Love for my mother, Georgette, who will turn 91 on May 5th, 2022. She is my inspiration to engage in this work, which is a curriculum on Sumud, dedicated to the young people of Palestine. As I complete this curriculum this spring, it marks my mother's journey of disposition and displacement 70 years ago, as a teenage daughter of the printing press owner growing up in what is now called West Jerusalem. Her uprootedness would encompass several stops inside and outside Palestine before she makes her life as a teacher, wife and mother in Bethlehem, a mere 10 miles away from her beloved home and city, Jerusalem. The curriculum is technical. It seeks to provide guidance for, education, for educators in higher education as to how the material can be taught so that students emerge with meaningful experiences of civic engagement and sustained lifelong activism. Yet, if one examines closely the content, it is more of a story of my mother's creative, daily proactive agency and that of many others like her carried out with determination, purpose, and humility. More aptly, one can say it is a documentation of the decades-long invisible mental, spiritual, and physical strength of a population that refused to give up on its homeland, Palestine. My mother's narrative, depicted in the different, in the different lessons throughout this curriculum, is of stories and memories of cherished family members and community who withstood their suffering and attempts of erasure by reconstructing their lost homeland in their everyday lives, households, and neighborhoods. In Palestine, therefore, the dichotomy between private and public realms does not fully apply since domestic spaces instantiate communal and national responsibilities. My mother's Sumur is one of endless hope imparted to the generations that follow. If not, how then can we explain actually the recent Palestinian political prisoners use of spoons to escape an Israeli prison, one of the most technologically developed in the world? Sometimes her sumud was dormant. Sometimes it was active, but it was never absent. Sumud is what sustained her as a life-giving person of hope to hold on to being a Palestinian. My mother's teaching consisted of tireless delivery of the rich Palestinian authentic culture and practices that were communicated in every gesture, providing the foundation for our life expressions. Portrayals of ordinary people and figures of a past era were sketched so distinctly that they remain relevant to our present day encounters, 
My mother never ceased to speak to us about the house and neighborhood she grew up in, Al Baqa, even the tides, actually, the, the look of the tides. Vividly describing the architecture of the stately homes and green streets that clearly conveyed people's appreciation of aesthetics, harmony with the environment, and a vision for a prosperous future. Although she did not possess any photos of her pre-1948 life, as her family, like so many others, were forced to leave their home abruptly, she painted graphic descriptions of trails they hiked covering a landscape that is difficult to recognize any longer, but it is still mapped out in our internal guiding system. Her detailed accounts of local histories, including festivals and celebrations, made it possible for us to comprehend the genealogy of our presence within this place and grasp the miracles of this land when situated within contextual frameworks. A Palestinian wedding with its communal nature and al Oni practice can actually have five fishes and two loaves, and no one will leave the table hungry. Food was central to my mother, Sumud. Her passion for the Palestinian kitchen and its culinary delights bordered on the holy, captivating us with anecdotes and lineages as she provided a lengthy biography of every dish. After all, she was a school teacher of history and geography. All this work was my mother's way of cultivating sumud in her home and surroundings. A memorialization process of the lost homeland was invoked in all details, big or small. And it was weaved, they were weaved into our both our imagination and reality so that Palestine would not be forgotten. There were no epic colossal events that drew attention to her discourse of resistance. On the contrary, she and numerous collective others sustained a momentum of deep-rooted political understanding and work in the most ordinary of undertaking, and yet in the most challenging of tasks. Her understanding and ethos for reclaiming Palestine was to sustain dignity, hope, identity, and land while we're aiming at self-determination and liberation. Sumut, therefore, was created for and by the people. Its grassroots character and community ownership renders it among the most viable forms of resistance, creative in its application as each individual is autonomous in his or her expression of resistance, while unique in its impact, as its impact can only be felt collectively. Now, as my mother battles dementia, her memory has diminished to the point that she no longer remembers even us, her children. And yet, and given who she is, it is not surprising that she continues to remember her name, her home in Jerusalem, the neighborhood, the city and country. Her remaining memories are all about her beloved homeland and her sumud did not abandon her. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Rana, for sharing this very personal piece, but also very meaningful. Uh, it was very moving to hear about your mother and uh, how she has been an inspiration to you and how you carry what she has taught you with. <clears throat> I loved uh, how you talked about lifelong activism as being creative, as daily proactive agency. Sometimes in uh, most ordinary everyday undertakings, as you just described. Um, and also the importance of how these practices are passed down from one generation to the other. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I am remembering, Rana, when you first applied to the RCPI fellowship, your project was to develop a civic engagement curriculum for Palestinian higher education. Um, and as you've spent more time with the project, it's evolved. And now you don't talk so much about civic engagement per se, you talk about smooth. And so I thought it might be interesting for you to share with us your journey, what it has looked like and how your project has evolved as you've 
spent more time with us and with it itself. Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, reaching to the conclusion to focus on Sumud as a framework uh, was not so clear at the beginning. Uh, perhaps partly due to the popular perception of uh, Sumud as it became um, uh, equated with resilience, and that in itself became the buzzword for uh, projects and donors and the development world of grants and so on and so forth. And yet, uh, as this journey, the past year, but also a, a, a lot of reflection and the sense of responsibility for all those who were responsible for this process to get to a point where there is a need for a curriculum for civic engagement and toward in higher education, and those who will be involved in this process, including the students, the educators, the communities, uh, the universities themselves, I felt that there is a need to progress into this thing called Sumut as the framework. And uh, if you allow me five minutes of this journey of how it started and why it ended the way it did. Um, uh, actually, like I said, the original question was, what approaches and practices are needed to include young people in civic engagement? And what would be the ideal space uh, that could nurture uh, 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 young people to claim their agency? And uh, uh, what would be uh, the space that would give the needed education where the young people could uh, develop uh, uh, critical mindsets, find their purpose, uh, engage with transformative visions, and uh, 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 just develop the necessary tools to be able to engage even in civic engagement. And as I, and together with many others of the colleagues and uh, people who are engaged in this field, we started actually looking at what were the traditional uh, incubators, what were the tra traditional spaces in Palestinian uh, history that could provide this uh, important uh, space and that proved its efficacy at one point uh, in time. And of course, immediately what jumped based on personal experience, but also experience of many others, uh, uh, Palestinian universities, actually have been or were the ideal spaces for something like this. Uh, because, uh, uh, and, and mind you, I am talking about a period when I say personal, a period which was during the first uprising, which perhaps is the, one of the most uh, 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 demonstrated uh, uh, example of sumut, of the steadfastness. Uh, and the education that was provided uh, within a university actually did not take place in the classroom only. Uh, rather, it took place outside of the classroom, in the cafeteria, in the grounds outside, in the streets. And the type of education actually uh, was very innovative and focused on uh, justice, the question of liberation, self-determination, rather than perhaps today it's more involved about building uh, the state and the state building and all that. So that was one example, but still the university allows for working with young people because it's a structured space. Uh, relatively, there's a long time period of time where students are there and there are tools that one could work with the young people, such as the student council, uh, uh, the grounds, the classrooms, uh, readings, and so on and so forth. So uh, it was decided that the university actually would be the one. Um, but focusing on civic engagement and how the uh, journey starts, uh, what do we mean by civic engagement and especially citizenship? Because there's a lot of talk about citizenship, leadership, citizenship. Do we actually, uh, what kind of model are we looking for when we want to work with students? Do we want students to learn about citizenship or do we want students to learn through citizenship? And again, we need to remind you, this is a context of Palestine under 
occupation, apartheid, settler colonial. <laughs> uh, so what do we want? Because learning about citizenship is a traditional task, generally speaking, of uh, formal education, and it's the subject of civics. So students usually are exposed to the historical and cultural understanding of, uh, uh, of citizenship and what are the citizens' rights and responsibilities. So it's more like a, a, it's more like a status. And it focuses mainly on the, again, generally speaking, the political juridical aspect of uh, uh, citizenship. Learning through citizenship is actually the practicing it in everyday life. Mm. And it's informal. It's, it's, adult, it's informal. And it is from the bottoms up. Mm. It's outside of the classroom. And so in looking in this, uh, it, the question then began, can there be a hybrid model in a context like Palestine? Because we are still... Uh, in the middle, <laughs> oh, if, if I can even say that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I started looking around at all the educational initiatives that are in existence in Palestine and to question, or the model, to question the form of learning that has been uh, applied so far. Does it really uh, introduce and bring about uh, critical individuals and collectives, students as a young people collective, or are we really, and the aim right now has become to channel a young person's agency, political agency and agency into reproduction of the existing socio-political and economic order. Mm -hmm. What is happening? And as a practitioner, as someone who has worked with young people, I, I recognized uh, by working with them that uh, in order to empower, for them to, to claim their agency, we have to use indigenous understandings of civic engagement. And that was based on an experiment that I would do with first year students. As they come in, the question would be, uh, can you uh, identify, can you define what is civic engagement and can you define what is sumut? And Students, when they're asked this question, the civic engagement, they would go into, oh, it's urban, or oh, it's, uh, it's uh, funded, it's something outside. Mm. It is, I mean, there is no real understanding, really, of the concept. When I would ask about the sumut, they would say it is um, self-determination. It is... A, it is a, a, the land, it is a, a, a empowerment, it's, it's, it's so, it's all uh, uh, proactive, it's all, uh, in a, it's all symbolic of a, 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 of a, a, a status that uh, convey a, a, this, a, this uh, uh, power of the word, of the concept. Uh, it, it's dignity. It's the fallah. It's the refugee the right of return. Very interesting when they talk about sumud. And, and, and therefore, and by, by spending this last year examining and studying actually the different theoretical fr frameworks that address the context of Palestine and Israel. It became so clear all of a sudden, but through a long journey, that the only uh, perhaps one powerful paradigm that could meet and challenge the paradigm of the settler colonial that is being imposed on Palestine uh, is through the Sumut par uh, paradigm. Not, and we will, I will explain now what it even means. But because of its, uh, in, it's because of its connection to the land, because of its innate connection to hope, uh, uh, it can uh, be a, a, a framework to use for uh, the civic engagement. I mean, it was interesting. The students would say civic engagement is something small, smooth, something big. 
Maybe civic mm. engagement can be part of Sumut, but it's mm. never been. And therefore, the decision was like to make it the, the framework, the bigger framework. Yeah, thank you, Rana. That, that's uh, really exciting to see the evolution of your thinking, but also how you engage students in conversation around these concepts and their response to them. Um, I, I recall our conversation about your university experience during the first Intifada. I mean, when I asked you, you know, what was it in your education that inspired you and made you who you are to, to be caring about these issues? And you remembered those days from the first Intifada. And um, I think for many of us who experienced the first Intifada, the life uh, lessons and feeling of empowerment and agency that we felt is hard to forget and uh, remains a well of inspiration. Uh, I know it's true for me and one that I go back to uh, all the time for sustenance. So I can see how um, focusing on Samud, going back to that well of inspiration, that hope that carries you through is 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 in a way much bigger than a civic engagement and it's uh more encompassing so i mean you talked about an indigenous understanding of civic engagement and sumud as an innate connection to the land uh, i'm wondering if you could tell us more about that tell us about how you understand sumud maybe you gave us a very brief sort of uh, introduction at the beginning, but maybe you can expand more on that and tell us more how you understand it. What does it mean to you? Uh, yeah, thank you, Hilary. Uh, it was really wonderful to connect with you actually on that period. And everybody has a story or two or five of that period. And uh, the impact is huge. It's, it's life transformation. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what is Sumud? As, as you dig deeper, uh, there isn't really, a, a, I, it's difficult to come up with an inclusive, all-encompassing definition of the term. I mean, the most literal that I just gave before, the literal translation is steadfastness or perseverance. And I said sometimes it is uh, it translated into resilience. However, and here I, my apologies, I don't want to reduce it to a sentence about what is resilience, but uh, uh, that word particularly has its problems, especially uh, 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 if, uh, because it's seen as conforming to a neoliberal uh, a view of how individuals and societies behave uh, during crisis or uh, and so on. And this is a different situation, Palestine. Um, also, uh, resilience, usually it is uh, uh, usually a, 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 a more of a state of mind, whereas Sumud, it's both a state of mind, but also orientation to action. Uh, when looking through the literature and personal interviews and, 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 really, what is Sumud? But you talk to people and you see even uh, as if like they are physically transformed. I will not say who, but <laughs> like you say the word and people just uh, are alive and hopeful. Um, and there are many examples of Sumud, individual collective, in the worst of time and the most extreme situation and in the everyday life and the multiple ways, but it is always in the presence of, it's, it's mentioned, and the ways in the presence of the occupier and to resist oppression. And it could mean the everyday practices that we engage in as the population uh, that create and cultivate spaces to devise strategies that contest the oppressor's uh, authority, crossing checkpoints going harvesting the land uh, defacing the wall a lot of that so mood can also be uh, identified with active political agencies 
uh, such as the Intifada, the popular resistance, a political prisoner strike, when they, they take the fasting for tens and hundreds of days, uh, uh, creating and establishing solidarity economies or local economies. Uh, it can also uh, be considered as a mental state of strength. Uh, and uh, it's translated into not accepting the status quo, maintaining hope, maintaining humanity, and uh, always uh, trying to go to that uh, moral higher ground. And uh, it can also be a cultural value and cultural forms, dance, heritage, traditions, festivals, uh, 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 all in some one way or another also connected to the land and staying put uh, despite continuous assaults. They staying steadfast, a cultural strategy of memorialization. So it's not one thing or another. And with the Sumud, there comes a lot of symbols and icons, actually. One is connecting, connecting with the land, the land itself. But in connection with the land, it's the fallah, the farmer. It is the olive tree. It's the mother in connection with mother nature and the land again. It's the refugee and so on. So when looking at this, and I went through different phases as to then how to explain it, I could see that it is actually the most appropriate uh, description or term that can be given to uh, uh, Sumud is that it is a form of indigenous lived philosophy mm. of Palestinians. Well, but I, you know, as you're just speaking now, all the different examples that you gave are um, so inspiring. And yes, there are so many stories that connect all of them. I, I love the idea of the indigenous lived philosophy. Um, and as you were speaking, and as we were just speaking right before this started, I connected with something that uh, we just read for a class. Uh, um, that quotes Edward Said's words on Palestinian existence. So if you don't mind, I'd just like to read it and see um, how you see if it connects to sort of this idea of indigenous lived philosophy. So um, Said writes, the essence that the essence of the Palestinian experience is simultaneously the colonization of Palestine and Palestinian resistance to that colonization. It is a struggle, he says, between a Palestinian presence and the Zionism that seeks to cover over, eradicate or erase that presence. Palestinians' affirmation of their own existence and their insistence on remaining in Palestine confounds the colonial narratives that seek to define them only as impossible, irrelevant, troublesome, or problematic. Um, for me, this speaks a lot of what you had shared in terms of all the other descriptions, um, but also connecting it to sort of this, this indigenous lived philosophy. I'm wondering if, how you see these words connect to, um, to, to your approach to how you see Sumud, and would you, would you agree, would you add to this? Um, he is written. He basically <laughs> he put his finger on on, on it because because uh, uh, the idea is that as the people uh, are rooted in the land, they derive their resistance actually and the strength to maintain the land, the identity, the community from that indigenous knowledge, history, faith way of life that we call Sumud. And uh, um, I see that as a indigenous lived peoples, uh, the people's lived philosophy, uh, mm -hmm. it, it is capable of challenging the dominant settler colonial political construct and imaginaries of Palestine, uh, uh, which the latter is based on the knowledge of power and domination 
but the Zumud and this philosophy is, is able to present alternatives since it integrates and weaves in and builds on the rich diversity and variety of our historical lived and embodied experiences dealing with empires and oppression. I mean, uh, the last 100 years is, is, is one of a, a, a construct that seeks to erase and remove and take the land. And therefore, the Sumud is capable of, uh, based on all that genealogy, is to be able to challenge uh, this uh, aggression uh, by, a, 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 by using and a living and embodying uh, this knowledge, this way of life that is so close to the land. It relates to everything around. Its stories are not stories. They are part of people's way of life. It's indicative of where we're at at this point. And, and uh, uh, by claiming, uh, uh, by claiming uh, that Sumud is an indigenous uh, a form of lived philosophy, uh, I, will, I, I do not I don't mean to territorize it into one like, oh, it's under philosophy as text and reflection. No, it's what I mean is the fact that it is a, it is a, a, an actual lived wisdom that our ancestors developed and it is always in motion. It's always in motion and able, capable of a, a being a, a capable of empowering people to resist and to withstand. Um, and it, 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 it's a question of why we have this life and how we are meant to live it. Yeah, I think um, we have ample examples of this, even in the news today, as we watch what's happening in Jerusalem. Yes. As a, um, it's ongoing and it's evolving. Uh, and as you said, it doesn't stay static, but it's rooted in, in knowledge that's passed on, and it has um, uh, a, a strong base from which to pull from. I uh, thank you, Rana, for sharing all of this. I'm wondering now, with you have uh, shared with us your inspiration for your project, you've explained the evolution. Of, of your thinking around it and your understanding of Samud. Now, how do you envision translating Samud into a framework for a university curriculum? Um, you talked about your time at the university during the first Intifada and how that university environment was allowed for uh, transformation in during that time. Um, so Maybe you can talk a little bit more about your work at the university and how, how you see this as a framework in a curriculum, if, if, if applicable. Uh, okay. Uh, again, I need, to, uh, uh, I need to emphasize that this curriculum does not teach smooth. It smooth is embodied. Uh, and whoever engages with it as a lived philosophy, it's, it's not being taught. But in reality, whoever the students will engage with this curriculum that is uh, uh, under this framework will engage with a set of relationships that work to transform this individual. And th those relationships are a part of what constitutes sumo. And I, I, have, I have worked to identify four kinds of relationships. The relationship between one and the other, between peoples, community. 
the relationship between people and land. And here it's the question of relatedness and not ownership. That's very important for an indigenous understanding, an indigenous understanding. Or space, place, uh, the relationship between people and spirituality, not only in terms of faith and the higher uh, being, but it includes hope, it includes uh, uh, cultural forms. We a few uh, sessions ago, we talked about what is the sacred and what is not, and how we define sacred. Um, uh, cultural figures, uh, values like empathy, uh, love, and so on. And the last is the relationship to self. So uh, these relationships inform the learning outcomes within the five axes that uh, I had based the curriculum on, the five that the students will be exposed to. But these relationships that are inspired from Sumu, they will inform the learning outcome. And, and so knowledge. We want students, of course, to have enhanced knowledge of uh, issues. Uh, the past and current uh, 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 civil resistance efforts. This is very important. Historical uh, knowledge, uh, community actions, uh, first intifada, for example, uh, 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 stop the wall initiatives like Putros village, uh, Bilain, uh, Bab al Shams uh, village in 2012. These are important, stop uh, important uh, examples of resilience in the Palestinian sense of sumut and action. Uh, currently the BDS and so on. Uh, but also uh, students, I would want to, to hope that they would have more knowledge of the systems that uh, uh, the constructs, the paradigms that actually uh, uh, affect their lives. So they need to be more aware uh, and, and, and knowledgeable about these. Uh, second, uh, access is the skills. Uh, uh, the skills uh, in terms of uh, communication, how they're able to debate, advocacy, meditation, but also reflection and storytelling. This is very important. The third, and that's, uh, perhaps one of the critical access that had affected my own life, which is the community service. In recent years, for universities, community service means internship, which is completely not the case in the past during my time at the university. Community service was field work where groups would go as collective, employing the concept of al interdependence, communal interdependence, to harvest the land, to, to help with, uh, with building a house, and so on and so forth. And they were able to travel beyond their immediate scope. So we would go from one uh, town to the next. Uh, and, and that in itself was very educational for a, a young person to be able to be exposed to a different uh, community and to be engaged in this sort of teamwork. And, and that will be a very important element in this education. The fourth is community building. Again, this is an important uh, part in, in the sense of it's a question of identity, establishing trust among the different communities, this travel back and forth to be exposed to the different issues that each which, which in the past 20, 30 years with the wall and the checkpoints and so on, Palestine has become fragmented in the sense we hardly get out of the 10 mile zone. Uh, and so this would be a very important mission of the curriculum to enable the young people to uh, build uh, uh, communities beyond uh, the five mile radius. And, uh, uh, and with community building also, it will be very important to look at the spaces. How do we relate as we look at community, the spaces that we have around us? So that, for example, a cafeteria of the university, it's now currently seen as a food court. This was not the case 
cafeteria was a hospitality and a place for debate. Mm. So it has to be reorganized in such a way that it becomes a hospitality, a location, and a place for debate where outsiders can be invited to speak about issues and to, and to meet the different peoples. And uh, the last thing is the action where every student or a group of students will be responsible for creating initiatives and uh, films. As a, as a university of the arts, it will be more in the fact like film, art, education, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so uh, the curriculum, uh, if you allow me just a few more minutes to speak about. So uh, 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 the curriculum at the Dar al Kalima uh, will be a, a part of the transformation that happens uh, uh, as a result of implementing this curriculum is that students uh, are able to express this indigenous lived philosophy and convey the idea of sumud by telling stories mm -hmm. through different mediums mm -hmm. and uh, uh, whether, whether it is film using new technologies but also it could be done in other ways and uh, the most important is that for the young people in Palestine to understand, again, that sumud is not something abstract or invisible, but it is part of their lives. It is, it is, and they will continue and continue to express it because it is their lived philosophy. And yeah. that's the idea behind it. Yeah, yeah. I can see the how you're thinking your lived experience as a university student during the first intifada, your understanding of smooth and envisioning the campus you live, you work at now. How, I know you, <laughs> how, you know, you want to bring those days back. Uh, um, but but I, I I completely see it. I, I see the how how much hope that brings and how much it has impacted you and how much it can impact the students. I know we are short for time, but you have something to share with us. Uh, yes. Creation by one of your students, so. Uh, I would like to share, it's only a five minute uh, film of a student uh, that uh, actually, uh, her name is Ala uh, Daye. She is uh, this young woman from the old city of Jerusalem. And it would be very important to see, uh, uh, and it explains, uh, it was done, actually, it was originally the idea of doing this film was by another young filmmaker at the university, his name is Lu'ai Awad, he and her were going to work together on a, a, a film, and uh, 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 he writes, as the film was produced, he says, my friend Ala Iddaye has always told me stories about her and about Jerusalem. When I decided to shoot a film about her, I asked her to record her story on my phone and to write the idea of the film. But this recording was the movie. Stories like hers are very necessary to hear. And this film actually shows the perception of Sumud from a young person's, through the young person's eyes. I mean, she explains in the best way possible her own sumud vis-a-vis uh, -vis her, uh, her, uh, her uh, situation and the fact that she is this young woman from the old city uh, of uh, Jerusalem. She explains how her political experience, entry, identity, how it all came together. So it's only five minutes. If uh, possible, we can show it. Uh, من طفولتي حياتي في البلد القديمة فرضت علي أفهم السياسة مني حدش كان يفهمني سياسة بس الحياة اللي كنت أعيشها كانت تفهمني كل شيء كنت أحاول أعبر عن الإشي اللي بعيشه كنت مرات أرسم مرات أصور مرات أشوف ناس بتظاهروا أحب أشارك معهم أهلي كانوا دايما يمنعوني 
لأنهم خايفين علي مصدر الخوف هذا اللي بمنعنا نشارك ونعبر عن رأينا ما كنتش فاهمة شو سبب خوفهم كنت أتصرف بالنفاعية بتذكر مرة طلعت باب العمود شفت ناس بتظاهروا فشاركت بهذا اليوم كنت رافع علم فلسطين مع المتظاهرين وكنت كتير مبسوطة إني بحاول أعبر عن حالي بعدها ضربني الجيش تعرضت لأبشع أنواع الضرب أول ما ضربوني استوعبت شو اللي عم بيصير إنه أول إشي عملولي إياه هو خنقوني وجروني بالأرض ما كنتش أتخيل بيوم إني راح أتعرض لهذا العنف إجا الإسعاف حاول يحملني منهم ياخدني فهم كانوا يشدوا من شقة والإسعاف يشد من شقة حسيت بالإهانة كأن لعبة <تصفيق> بضحك لأنه الإشي جد كتير بلحك كأني لعبة كل واحد بشد من شقة بالآخر نجحوا المسعفين يحملوني وقعدوا يركضوا فيه بعد تقريبا ثلاث سنين كان في مظاهرات قدام باب السلسلة لأنه الجنود رفضين يفوتوا أي حدا من الفلسطينيين عشان يصلوا بالأقصى وكان هذا الإشي بيستفز مشاعر الناس الموجودة كانوا يتظاهروا فأنا وقفت جنبهم ما شاركت معهم بس كنت حابة أكيد أكون موجودة فانهالوا علي مجموعة من الجنود والقوات الخاصة والشرطة مسكوني بضوا يضربوني صعبتش كمان شو اللي بيصير عادوا يخنقوني بطبيعة الحال أنا ما كتفتش إيدي ما عدتش أتفرج عليهم هم يضربوني أول ردة فعل إلي كانت بديت أبعدهم عني بإيدي وبجري وزادوا بضربي فوتوني على المغفر أول ما فتت على المغفر سكروا الباب ودبوني على الأرض وقعدوا تفقي جندية بدأ الضرب ينهال علي وخلعت لي حجابي والدبابيس فاتوا بجلدي لما قمت عن الأرض أول إشي عملت لطشت كف هاي كانت ردة فعلي اتهموني إن ضربت الشرطة وعرقلت عملهم بس أنا قلت لهم ولا عرقلت عمل الشرطة ولا ضربتهم بس دفعت عن نفسي بعدها تقريبا بسنة بعتولي ورقة استدعاء لمحكمة عد الأيام عد الساعات عد الدقايق اللي راح تيجي فيهم المحكمة كنت خايفة من النتيجة بديش أكون بالسجن ما خلقتش عشان أكون بالسجن ما عمريش بحياتي فكرت إنه مكاني صح هو السجن مقدرش أقعد بالبيت يومين كيف بدي أقعد بالسجن هذا الإشي كان يوترني كنت أتوتر من كل شيء أي شيء بالحياة كان يوترني لما إجا وقت المحكمة ما اقتنعتش بهاي الفكرة كنت قادرة أتخيل إنه فوق ما أنا ما قدرتش أخد حقي منهم وأقاضيهم أقبل بهيك إشي وقفت قدام القاضي وفقت إني أشتغل وفقت على العقوبة بس عشان أخلص من هالمحاكم أخلص من هالقرف وأكمل حياتي وأقدر أتعلم لأنه هذا الموضوع كتير بشتتني كرهت كل شي كرهت السياسة كرهت أشوف الجيش كرهت أشوف المستوطنين كرهت أشوف الإعلام كرهت كل شي مش هذا الإطار اللي بدي أكون فيه فرحت انتقلت لبيت لحم كنت أقضي كتير وقت مع حالي أعمل بس إيش بدي أفتح شباك الصباح ما لقيش قدام جنود ما لقيش قدام إعلام إسرائيل بس كمان بعد فترة حسيت حياتي فاضية مش هاد الحياة اللي تربيت عليها تربيت إني أطلع على شوارع القدس كل يوم تربيت إني أقعد بالشارع أكون قريبة من هاي المناطق اللي بحبها وبتحبني لهيك بالآخر قررت أرجع قررت أرجع أتحمل كل شي بصير بالبلد قررت أعيش دون هذا الواقع المفروض علي وتأكدت إن وجودي بالقدس لحالة مقاومة Thank you for sharing that. An example of uh, Samoa existence is resistance, um, but it's it's not a passive resistance. I, I liked your um, what you shared before about resilience, 
being different than uh, sumud. It's not passive. Uh, often resilience is seen as passive, but uh, sumud has the active piece to it. In this case, you have a young woman who has uh, decided to defy everything to 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 exist in a situation that's very difficult but it's she has the strength from the community from um what she learns from people around her to strengthen her to continue but she came to her own conclusion uh a beautiful film by the way and you know, example of the work of students at Daril Kalima, who many of them have won awards, so maybe yeah. you can talk uh, a bit more about this. <laughs> I mean, uh, another student who won actually at the, no, oh, this gives me <laughs> the exact award, but at the, um, the festival, the big festival in France. And, it's it's a film called Ambiance, which actually mm. talks about life within the Haitian refugee camp. Again, it's another example. And what is interesting is that, like, she's nineteen. To have had this sort of uh, transformation is really remarkable. And for example, Ala, just to connect to the other uh, colleagues who presented uh, earlier, Ala is one of the six now. So, so she, it's not only that she is in uh, uh, the old city of Jerusalem being steadfast, but she's actively also sharing other stories. So for example, she's one of the six students who are working with uh, uh, the, 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 uh, where uh, Ariel uh, Weeks the back, southern hills of Hebron, and the southern hills of Hebron, where all the students are collecting uh, uh, the uh, archives of of that uh, struggle, and actually also uh, uh, making different films about. Uh, 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 the the uh, resistance uh, of uh, southern hills of Hebron, and so and so it, it is really uh, this sort of engaged uh, young people that we see uh, 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 to, to be able to narrate the story, their stories, basically in this way to be able to reach out uh, and tell and tell of also this amazing. Uh, philosophy uh, that sustains and keep people uh, 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 hopeful. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. A wonderful note to end on, and I uh, look forward to seeing. You. Thank you, Rana, for taking us on this journey with you. Thank you and so much. Look forward yes. to learning more about Sumud and recognizing it more in the many of the stories that we hear and the people that we meet. Thank, so you. thank you, Juan. Thank you, Rana. And uh, thank you for ending our series in such a wonderful way. Thank you, Rana. Bye bye, everyone. Sponsor Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative. Copyright 2022, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.